Good afternoon and welcome to this uh, session, moving from fragility to long-term resilience. We have already been inducted in the subject when we had a very interesting presentation. Let us take it a little bit further and go into a dialogue with a number of colleagues that uh, have come from the membership as well as some of the IFAD staff who are engaged and actually live and work through some of these very difficult, fragile situations. And whilst they are settling into their seats uh, this afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, governors, we are reminded that there are a number of factors that do contribute to a country's fragility, and we heard good experiences and stories there. We realize that they all jeopardize the chances of eradicating poverty and achieving the sustainable development goals, so we have to address fragility. This session will be an opportunity to hear from the governors in an interactive manner about what their experiences and concerns are in maintaining a secure and stable country and growing rural economy. We will also hear from the Secretary General of the G7 Plus. He will describe what that is and will give an opportunity to tell us what are the key lessons that they are uh, taking from fragile and post-conflict affected countries that belong to the G7 platform. In fact, as we speak, please welcome our first guest, Helda Da Costa, Secretary General of the G7 Plus Secretariat, based in Timor-Leste. You're welcome, sir. Let us also welcome His Excellency Said Hussein Eid, the Minister of Agriculture and Irrigation from the Federal Government of Somalia. You're welcome, sir. Oh, thank you. Sorry. <laughs> Madam Majida Sheikh, the Chief Program Department, Ministry of Agriculture of the Lebanese Republic. You're welcome, Madam Sheikh. <laughs> Tarek Cobb is the Country Program Manager for Lebanon for IFAD. You're welcome, Tarek. And <laughs> Kaushik Baru, he is Acting Country Program Manager for Somalia here in IFAD in Rome. You're welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, give them a round of applause. I am Perrin saint -Ange, as was introduced by Mr. Skinner. I am the Associate Vice President and Head of the Program Management Department here in IFAD, and I will moderate this session this afternoon. We have heard from the President of IFAD this morning that indeed, please sit down, that indeed the relationship between fragility, poverty, and hunger is essential to understand. And we need to do a better job at really coming to grips with all these interactions. Yeah. Fragility does create hunger, poverty, and migration. But hunger, poverty, and inequality can also lead to conflict and instability. We also heard from the lecture with J.J. Messner that fragility is complex, affecting everyone and varies from country to country. Nonetheless, according to the OECD, in 2015, fragile economies were home to about 1.4 billion people, or 20% of the world's population. This is not a small number. Over the past 15 years, 3.34 billion people, or almost half the world's population, has been affected by violence, another form of fragility. OECD estimates that the global economic impact of violence and or conflict is about 13.6 trillion US dollars, equivalent to 13.3% of global GDP, with civilians, especially children and women, being most at risk. So, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, fragility does matter. Okay. Matters to you, and it matters to us here in IFAD, and it does matter to our panelists today. In order to help build resilience and increase the capacity of rural communities to manage risks and sustain shocks caused by fragility, I would like to introduce 
the first question to the panelists, Dr. Da Costa. Before we discuss the particular case of Somalia and Lebanon, would you please briefly introduce us to the G7 Plus and its mandate? Thank you, moderator. Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank uh, President of IFAD, distinguished governors and delegates from all over the world. The G7 Plus is a platform comprising of 20 fragile and post-conflict countries, ranging from the Pacific, Asia, Africa, <coughs> Middle East, and the Caribbean. It was established in 2010 in Dili Timor-Leste at the Forum of International Dialogue on Peace Building and State Building, immediately after the third high-level forum in Accra on aid effectiveness. At that time, seven countries came together to monitor the new engagement for good international engagement in fragile states of the OECD. And then afterwards, eight years later, we now have 20 member states around the world. Driven by the principles of voluntarism, solidarity, and cooperation, these 20 countries have now gained the momentum, and we are the lead advocate of the goal number 16 on peace, justice, and strong institutions of the sustainable development goals that we all are now implementing. It is unique, a unique forum that enables member countries to share experience on peace building and state building. We have developed the so-called fragile to fragile cooperation with the notion of moving out from fragility towards resilience. The topic that IFAD chose this year is close to our heart. I remember our distinguished uh, minister from Somalia. We deal with, a lot with the, the minister of planning from Somalia. And Somalia is a country that people said it's a failed state, but we said no. The mentality of the people of Somalia is so resilient. So for us, the fragility, according to the definition of the ministers that we had the first ministerial meeting in Juba in 2011, the fragility is defined as the period of lacking of the state lacking the capacity to provide service in peace building and state building to the people in post-conflict situations. That was the Dr. most. Dr. Costa will come back to you yeah. and we'll get a bit of a uh, first run from our other panelists. But Minister Hussein, once again, welcome. I have a two-part question for you. 27 years after the start of the civil war, what are the key drivers of fragility in Somalia? And what are the key challenges linked to that crisis which impedes its sustainable development? Thank you for having me here and thanks to IFAD President and Governing Council for inviting us. Somalia, after 27 years of civil war, it has um, more challenges and also more opportunities together. The key challenge of, of fragility is we have uh, internally displaced people as well as refugees still remaining outside the country. We have a, a recurrent drought every year. Somalia is hit by uh, the drought which damages almost uh, many things. The recent drought assessment needs report issued by the Minister of Planning of Somalia in collaboration with our international partners estimated Somalia requires 1.5 billion amount of money to recover from the drought which hit Somalia in 2016. So we have also depleting water of the two rivers, which, which mainly irrigate the agriculture in Somalia. We have also the post conflict legacy of the, the almost a complete destruction of the agricultural infrastructure in the country. Recently, we had uh, 
national food security strategy of the country. There is also every drought which happens in the region, the Horn of Africa region in general, and Somalia in particular, transforms to famine. So these are the main challenges. But also we have other opportunities where Somalia, after 20 plus years of civil war, anarchy, we have a very strong and very popular government elected in the last year, President Mohamed Abdullah Farmajo, which is with, with great uh, program of reform in all sectors, security, uh, livelihood, uh, product, productive sectors, and also reforming the institutional capacity of the government. So that is the indication now we have a very positive indication from multinational, multinational organizations, financial institutions like World Bank, IMF, all giving an indication that Somalia is coming back to, the, uh, to a healthy financial, public financial system where we are now in negotiation with IFAD to restart so it is operation in Somalia after long absence in Somalia. We, that, that's why we have also a great experience. Somalia has a very vibrant diaspora. Our people are entrepreneur, they have very entrepreneurship spirit. We have very we have a huge resources of Somalia is the host of uh, livestock, huge livestock, number one in camel population in the world. Also, we have a, a, almost a 10 million hectares of land uh, suitable for all types of, of, of agricultural production. We also have the longest sea in Africa, 3,300 miles, which is also a home for huge reserve of fish in the, in, in the world. We have also other natural resources, so we need, as my friend was uh, uh, telling, fertility in, is the state in which the state is not able to deliver it, the required services to its people. So Somalia is coming back. Somalia, in our recent budget, we have the first time a budget increase in the education, health, and also productive sectors. So despite a great danger of fragility, and also its subsequent effects on human and also on, on, on animal, but we are resilient people. After 27 years of civil war, Somalia still have, uh, we are doing in many areas very good uh, resilience. So we, we believe with the help of the international, our international partners, Somalia will come out and will be able to stand at its own feet to face the shocks of the climate change and, and also recurrent drought. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Minister. We, we did hear from the previous speaker that it is not, fragility is not a terminal situation. We can bring about the necessary changes and I can hear from your very, very committed uh, presentation that you have taken steps. You are on the way to addressing some of these concerns. You do need some help and we are here also for that, particularly for the smallholder agriculture and natural resource management in the rural space. Madam Minister, uh, what is the situation in Lebanon? Yes, uh, uh, thank you. And uh, I will speak in Arabic, uh, please. Uh, Allow me first of all to extend the greetings of the Minister of Agriculture in Lebanon to the IFAD, to the President and Governors, as well as all delegates. As regards our topic, uh, from fragility to resilience, the rural areas in Lebanon are facing huge issues. The displacement in Lebanon led to a phenomenon which is the ruralization of cities. This is caused by the lack of centralization or decentralization in some areas. 
climate change is among the main issues in the agricultural sector today. During the last four years, the snow cover decreased by 40%, and in Lebanon, we are facing some kind of desertification. We are facing problems after the Syrian crisis. The channels of transport between Lebanon, Syria, and the Gulf region were blocked. Lebanon used to export 60% of its agricultural produce through Syria. However, this decreased starting from 2012. I would like to confirm what was said by my colleague from Jordan as regards the issues of Syrian refugees and the burdens in the neighboring countries. Among the repercussions of the Syrian crisis, we can cite that the refugees' number of uh, Syrians in Lebanon became very high, and they are competing with Lebanese on the use of natural resources. There are other challenges in Lebanon, particularly in the current situation. There is a lack of continuous security and stability due to the threats by Israel against Lebanon. These threats lead to the drop of investments, particularly in the agricultural sector. Allow me to talk about challenges, and later on I would like to emphasize the solutions or the action plan that is devised by the Ministry of Agriculture. This is very interesting, but we are also particularly keen to understand what IFAD, through some of the work that we are doing, both in Lebanon, but also in Somalia and other parts of the world. Tarek, you are the country program manager and you are supervising IFAD funded initiatives in Lebanon. What would you like to contribute in the context that was presented by our panelists? Thank you very much, Mr. AVP. Uh, I'll speak from the perspective of IFAD as a country manager, as you've explained. And really, the country team was confronted with a number of challenges, as mentioned by Ms. Lebanon Governor. But allow me to stress the fact that from 2008 until 2017, IFADS only had a loan, and loan for a project to harvest water in the Heli Lakes and establish farmer service center. And then it was crowned by a grant uh, from the Adaptation Fund uh, added in 2013, targeting smart agriculture. That was our only portfolio there. In the absence of the countries present, a caretaker government has taken over from 2014 and until 2016 to issue a single decree regarding our projects or any other issues, the cabinet must obtain 24 approval from 24 ministers. What has increased the country fragility is also the huge number of Syrian refugees, as Majid explained. And really, we, they lived in a very, I would say, annoying ratio of one refugee, one refugee, to five Lebanese population. Some of these refugees, of course, are skilled workers accustomed to work in the country, and others are smugglers, and for the part which concerns us of unhygienic food materials. And this comprised time bombs in the host communities and across the borders as well. Our missions stayed for about one year not be able to work in the country or to get the security clearance for some particular issues with, with the uh, different groups of the country. Maybe I'll explain later what had we done as an IFAD to reverse this uh, situation after we hear from the Lebanese side. Thank you very much. Minister, what about in uh, Somalia? What are the approaches that you are using to overcome some of these operational challenges, day-to-day -day basis, having so many forms and folders and clearances and also the bureaucratic approach. Whilst the needs are huge, the communities are demanding support, and yet the administrative weight 
does penalize the faster movements towards transition or change in the country. What are you, steps are you taking to overcome some of these? Uh, we have, as I told you, as I told you before, we have we have very ambitious uh, plan of reform, where the government is open to deliver the, the service to these people, and we have uh, narrowed the gap of these uh, bureaucratic uh, procedures to allow the people to regain their land. We have a land reform program in the, at the ministry to recheck re re and recorrect the the error is which happened in the era of the civil war, where some land has been, uh, there's conflict of other land. So the government is trying its best to remove any bureaucratic delay in it is service to the people. Thank you very much. Kaushik, what, what's your experience in Somalia? That's the minister. Absolutely. And you go there to help him from time to time, and you do engage with the communities, and you do engage with the institutions that are there to provide the enabling environment to make things happen. What do you take from the situation there I think as a country uh, program manager uh, in yes. Somalia? Th thank you, Pera. I think, I think our understanding of fragility and uh, resilience and how to build resilience aligns very closely with the Honorable Minister's understanding. Uh, in the last two years as IFAD, we have uh, hugely scaled up our operations in Somalia. Though we do not have access to IFAD's regular resources through the performance-based allocation system, we have worked through supplementary funds to design new programs. And what we have done, following from IFAD's fragile situation strategy, is we are trying to address root causes of fragility. We understand and we saw in uh, the previous interaction, in previous session as well, that fragility is multidimensional and complex, but there are some key causes that are within our scope of work. And we address them in design. Let me give you an example. Uh, when we design infrastructure, uh, and we're helping to uh, rebuild and rehabilitate infrastructure in some parts of Somalia, especially in the south, we know that the benefits of infrastructure and who will contribute to maintaining and who will, uh, yield, uh, who will enjoy the benefits of the infrastructure is a very contentious question. It's also contentious along clan lines and has been a source of conflict. So even before we start our works, we do a comprehensive mapping of all the clans in the area this is the unique fault line for fragility, and we make sure we cover that fault line. And then we uh, develop infrastructure that is community managed and whose benefits are, uh, are distributed equitably across clans. A unique arrangement and a unique means of managing infrastructure that we've developed in, in Somalia. There's another uh, important component in our projects. Uh, we have developed, tied in with the management of infra infrastructure, we've developed uh, peace building components where we use this opportunity to build infrastructure to also talk to communities about peace and reconciliation. We tell them the infrastructure is just a canal. A canal by itself doesn't mean much, but when we present this canal as a common interest for all communities that live along the canal, we have built a patchwork of communities with a common interest. And, and we, uh, we feed into Paul Collier's understanding of uh, moving out of fragility by building common interest. That's something we do critically in all our designs. Fantastic. Thank you very much. So why don't we extend this dialogue from this panelist right through to the uh, floor and get some feedback or some questions or suggestions from the membership as to what your take is on either the complexities of fragility as presented by our delegates or the way IFAD is addressing these challenges through our programs of work and loans and grants. Let me see if there are any flags for questions or answers or clarifications. I see one from France. Madam, you have the air. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Président. Thank you very much, Chairman. I'll be speaking French. I'd like to thank all the panelists from this afternoon's session. It's been extremely interesting so far. We'd really like to welcome the priority that IFAD has lent to this issue of fragility and resilience 
from a strategic standpoint as well as from a financial standpoint with the revised uh, performance-based allocation system, making it more sustainable. As far as France is concerned, I'd like to highlight the fact that it's really a priority for us too. Last week, we came up with a new French strategy in response to fragility, which was approved with the Sahel Alliance, which seeks to target development problems and multiply by two the funds allocated to dealing with fragility. I have three comments, which are partly questions, on the difficulty that comes with implementing these programs. Firstly, absorptive capacity. When it comes to countries absorbing this enhanced aid, we welcome EFED's engagement policy, which foresees a simplification of processes and procedures that target absorptive capacity. But with that simplification and this shorter circuit, what is your assessment on uh, the way that these new objectives will be achieved? The second question, the challenge between uh, bridging the gap between humanitarian aid and aid provided by others, for instance, WFP. What do you think the path to linking these two types of aid is. Thirdly, another finding is the need to focus specifically on women's empowerment and girls' empowerment in fragile situations. How do you envisage a greater focus on women? We think that this is a key strategic issue for countries that could really be delved into. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Ambassador. Are there any other requests for the floor? So, clarifications? <laughs> Let us go right away to the panelists, and I suggest that perhaps uh, the minister from uh, Somalia, could you give us one uh, kind of feeling for how the issue of absorptive capacity constrains the ability of your government, the communities, local institutions, and civil society to absorb the resources that may be coming your way to facilitate and help you in this transformation. A few words on absorptive capacity. The question of having capacity to absorb international help is, again, coming back to the question of egg and chicken. Who's, who's the first? The, uh, the international partners must, they are, they are under, under obligation to help the fragile countries to have a capacity to absorb those uh, funds. But if they make a condition that until unless the capacity, uh, to have a capacity, they make other implementing agencies, which are also from outside, from outside the, the same countries, which uh, these um, uh, international partners are from. So these fragile countries will remain incapacitated until unless the international partners work with them to have to gradually build their capacity so that at the end, when they have a capacity, they can transfer the implementation of those projects. But if they make a condition that until they have a capacity to absorb, they are going to get the help of other international partners, other international implementing agencies. There, these vulnerable countries or developing countries or fragile countries, whatever you call, will remain so. So we, in the Somali federal government, we are trying to, we put much emphasis to build the capacity of the, our institutions so that gradually, we will be able to implement those programs in a full scale. And also, in, in addition to what uh, Koshif was telling, in IFAD projects, really, those projects are almost in line with our national development plan, where much emphasis has been given to the long time 
the developmental projects instead of humanitarian and emergencies, which we were doing for the last 27 years. Somalia was receiving aid in terms of emergencies and, and humanitarian. So that was not giving our, us a resilience as well as a capacity to withstand the shocks of the road. Thank you. Thank you very much. Before I go back to the, the floor for uh, a question from South Africa, let me very quickly, Madam Sheikh, the issue of women, they bear the brunt of these challenges in countries which have this fragility and, and fragile situations. But at the same time, women are often the champions to bring about the necessary changes, the necessary enabling household capacity to make good uh, the, and overcome in a, in a comprehensive way the challenges that the families face. Your experience in Lebanon of women and fragility and how to address these in a very comprehensive way. Uh, in Lebanon, we have an observatory for rural women. It has been set up with the support of Italy. This observatory is focusing on the help of rural women in order to empower them, to help them secure development. We do have a number of uh, rural associations in Lebanon, and the Ministry of Agriculture does support uh, the women rural cooperatives. These cooperatives uh, receive help in order to set up centers or to buy some equipment or inputs so that uh, women are empowered economically, particularly in rural areas. However, the major shortage uh, in Lebanon is the lack of uh, employment. Women are not integrated in the job market adequately in Lebanon. Ideology, uh, on the uh, at the ideological level, there might be talk about the need to integrate women in the market. Uh, however, women, when they reach the decision-making process, women would be able to have a stronger voice in the city and the rural areas, and therefore, from the Ministry of Agriculture, we do support the rural women as cooperatives. These cooperatives are much more active than the male cooperatives, and I say this quite frankly. However, the major shortcoming is the fact that women are absent from the political decision-making process. Thank you. I was right to to assume, and, I, and our experience uh, globally does confirm that women are champions in addressing, moving forward, and taking these huge challenges uh, with a lot of responsibility and the agility it requires to, to make good out of this terrible situation that they face. But let's take a, a question from South Africa, please. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, the point that I want, I think someone raised a question of uh, that is very, I think it drew my attention, the question of uh, the root causes of fragility. Uh, if you can help us to unpack that, uh, I know that it's multi-dimensional, multi but of course there has to be inside there a, multi, a, a kind of a root cause. What are those uh, uh, root causes? Uh, and secondly, I think uh, the, the question of absorptive uh, capacity, uh, I, I think uh, to set conditions, uh, you know, for a country to say that will give you that uh, uh, on conditions that you have uh, some element of uh, absorptive uh, capacity, I think that robs that country of, uh, of an element of resilience. Because how then, because you have to help them to build up the resilience rather than uh, taking it the other way around and say that uh, we have an uh, absorptive capacity and all that. I thought uh, I should make that comment with respect to that particular issue of uh, of absorptive capacity. Thanks, Chair. 
Thank you very much. Uh, let's take another question from, from Jordan and we'll get back with a, with a set of uh, responses, probably pulling them together, uh, given the, uh, the, the interesting points raised by the panel. So Jordan, can we? Allow me, allow me to speak in Arabic. Uh, At the outset, I should like to welcome your distinguished guests. I don't have a question, but a simple comment, as was stated by my colleague from Lebanon. The major problem facing Jordan and Lebanon is the large flow of refugees. I believe that uh, IFAD's initiative called FARMS is it is a, a substantial initiative indeed. It will be a great help to the countries that were affected by refugees. As for the countries that want to move from fragility to resilience, this is of relevance to my country, Jordan, and thus I should like to thank IFAD and all countries that are taking part in this initiative. I do hope that this would, would secure sustainability to all plans that aim at helping refugees, IDPs, and help countries recover from the um, uh, present crisis. I believe that um, uh, more support to uh, this initiative in order to improve the resilience of countries, it would help these countries. But at the same time, we need more help in humanitarian terms. I should like to thank IFAD for granting us a concessionary loan to secure this goal. I do hope that IFAD would further support us in expanding this activity in, Le in Jordan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, we will. Short answer, but we'll get back with some more specifics uh, given the, the, the interesting points that you have raised. We have, nous avons une question du Togo. I see a question from Togo. Go ahead, please. <clears throat> Thank you, moderator. The delegate mentioned a problem which jeopardizes pro uh, efforts made by states which has to do with transhumans. Togo, like other countries from ECOWAS, has often been shaken by crises pitting pastoralists against farmers. Vis-a-vis -vis the situation, the government, along with actors from this area, have implemented an operational plan for the management of transhumans. Some three years ago, these crises began to fall. The incidence of these crises began to fall. And this has become a, an, an economic activity because pastoralists, are engaged in economic transactions along with farmers. However, we needed to take further steps to ensure that the operational plan which was developed for Togo could be expanded. We are in contact with other ECOWAS countries to ensure that other countries can replicate such a program which is beginning to yield results. So I would like to ask for the support of technical and financial partners to support countries in ECOWAS so that we can strive to have a consensual framework for transhumans actors to act so that all social components involved in this sector can benefit. It's also worth noting that Togo's government has implemented 
a support project for vulnerable populations due to climate change we have seen problems to do with flooding and drought therefore the government has sought to support gov vulnerable populations it's about working with farmers so that they can become more resilient when they face crises and so that they can themselves become development actors. Therefore, the government has also implemented a community development program along with UNDP and this program was launched some two years ago which seeks to establish social and economic development infrastructure in every town to facilitate development. This involves the healthcare sector and others to also help women become more effective in their activities. So once again, I would like to appeal to donors so that they may support these programs, which may lead by example in the sub-region. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Minister. There's also a question by Rwanda. Uh, thank you, moderator. I just wanted to make uh, some comments on uh, uh, causes of uh, fragilities. As we see it in uh, Africa or eastern part of the Africa, climate change is causing a lot of fragilities in uh, nations. We are observing a lot of drought frequencies, floods, frequencies, viral diseases, I different insects. So I think by this time, it's important that we think in addressing the fragility in a comprehensive way because all of these are leading to uh, movements of livestock and people. And when it comes to all of these movements, there's also conflicts that are following up all of that. So in Rwanda, we have been working as a government with our partners, especially IFAD is one of our partners. And we have been trying to design programs that can help people to be more productive, such as uh, programs that are looking at medium and small scale irrigation technologies. So that also is looking at uh, agricultural productivity, but also livestock productivity. So recently we engaged into a livestock uh, a project that is looking at promoting the dairy uh, productivity in a comprehensive way, and also providing the dairy cattle, as was mentioned by my colleague from Nigeria. Uh, there are many programs that are involved into small animals that are looking at uh, youth and women cooperatives. But also when you look at it, as uh, mentioned before, there is a need of affirmative actions that are looking at mainstreaming whatever we are doing in terms of building resiliences into rural communities, embedding in strong components that are tackling specific issues for women and youth employment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let us go back now to the panelists to, to have a round of responses to the many, many suggestions and comments and, 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 and requests for support in, in financing or providing additional sort of encouragement to the initiatives uh, launched by some countries. So, Mr. Da Costa, what do you take from, from the suggestions provided by the floor in terms of, in the first instance, capacity building. Capacity can be built, so it is part of our responsibility. It is an investment. You invest in building capacity. And the necessary dialogue and lessons learned that goes with it to really make this capacity sustainable and become better as we go along. Your views on that? Thank you. I have three main points I want to share with this August audience. First of all, with the G7 Plus, after listening to the uh, comments made by the distinguished delegates, I have 
one um, point to make for you, that it requires leadership and ownership within your country. This is what reminds me to the New Deal for Engagement in Fragile States, launched in Busan, which is subscribed by 45 countries and international agencies around the world. This New Deal sets the parameters and the uh, pr uh, principles on for state building and peace building goals. There are five of them. First, legitimate politics. Second, security, which is dealing with security in the country. Third, about justice. Fourth, economic foundation. And fifth is the service delivered to the people. When we talk about the capacity, absorbed capacity, when I listen to Honorable Minister, your country, your president, went to Brussels and proposed the so-called the New Deal for engagement in fragile states in Somalia, urging the development partners to use the country system to support the political dialogue at the country level. And this is something that development partners, I'm sorry to say, but is lacking to do this at the moment. It's a failure to, on, on the development partner side. Second point, when you talk about the, uh, uh, the, uh, the discourse about the uh, cause of fragility, we, the G7+, plus, small as we are, or as fragile as we are, we have developed a tool which we call the Diagnostic Tool for Fragility Assessment for G7 plus countries. These diagnostic tools comprise like a simple matrix. You plot the five peace building, state building goals I mentioned early on against the five stages of fragility, which means period of crisis, rebuild and reform, transition, transformation, and resilience. The more you achieve to the resilient stage means that you are out of fragility. The country is declared as graduated from fragility. When I listen to our guest lecturer, JJ Messier here, there are a lot of questions about that. Are you working together with the government? This is the difference. When the fragility assessment is made by the G7 plus countries, it is done by the countries themselves. It is involving this civil society, government officials, development partners, private sector, so that the results is participatory. And also it provides to the outside world that, that the country is peaceful enough for potential investors to come and invest in our country, in our rural economies. That's about the leadership and the vision and also the uh, ownership. And when we talk about the fragility assessment, the, the, the acronym of the New Deal called FOCUS. F stands for fragility assessment. What o stands for one vision and one plan. C means country dialogue. U means you use the, the support from outside to support the country system. And S means support the political dialogue. So final point, moderator. I want to say this to you, that no country wants to stay forever as a fragile. We want to, as soon as possible, move out from fragility. This is where IFAD, or IFAD, as an international agency, wants to help the fragile state. And my recommendation to you is this. Use the country system if you want to build the capacity of the country. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Kaushik, you have helped us uh, for the, in the recent past to pull together a uh, strategy, an approach, uh, an institutional dimension of the root causes of fragility and how our programs, loans and grants, can address these. Can you unbundle it a little bit uh, it's a comprehensive paper, so it's, it is very large. So in a few words, unbundle the issues of fragility and what we take from them and what we action on to address these issues. Yes, absolutely. Thank, thank you, Pera. Uh, in fact, I'm fascinated by the, by the question on root causes. And I want to start with a statement that uh, I think about and other commentators on fragility think about when we think about fragile states. And that is something that Leo Tolstoy said, which is that uh, all happy families are the same, but all unhappy families are unhappy in their unique way. Which means we can't think of global root causes of fragility. Each fragile context, uh, in Ifad, we have moved towards uh, countries with fragile situations. We don't call countries fragile states anymore which means that it's, we don't label the state as fragile, but we say that the country is going through a situation which is uh, increasing their fragility. And we think in, within each country or within each project area, we need to identify the local 
causes of fragility. In most cases, it is some combination of conflict, lack of institutional capacity, and these two vulnerabilities being exacerbated by external shocks. So it's an external shock and the reduced capacity of the country to respond to these shocks. The external shock is often, in the, uh, often comes in the form of climate change or climate change uh, disasters. And, and the state has a reduced capacity to respond to these shocks. How we respond? I would talk about three levels, design, implementation, and scaling up results. When I talk about design, I think we should look at what root causes are within our scope of work. We cannot move into uh, politics, but we can look at root causes within rural development. If it's pastoralist, we need much more in-depth design, either on pastoralist communities or on sharing resources or on building infrastructure. In-depth design and in-depth research. Second, on uh, monitoring. When I say monitoring, we need innovative monitoring uh, schemes. We need innovative monitoring uh, approaches such as GIS mapping, such as satellite mapping and real-time mapping of uh, activities. I heard uh, JJ Messner talk about how you can't keep your, uh, you have to keep your eye on the ball. In fragile situations, the game or the ball, so to say, is switching very suddenly, which means you have to be even more alert than in other contexts. So agile and innovative monitoring through GIS and technology uh, solutions. And finally, scaling up results. What we need to do is we need to recognize the limits of our activities. There are limits to what we can do just because of money or our capacity or our knowledge. And in a fragile context, it's very important that we recognize our limits. Though there are limits to what we can do, we can really move beyond our limits in terms of what we can achieve through partnerships. To give you a very quick example, in the project in Somalia, we realized that uh, where we want to engage more with the ministry and we should move more through national institutions. But here, we can build the canal, but if farmers near the canal receive water but are not integrated into a value chain, our ultimate objective has failed. Which is why even at the design stage, we are already talking to other donors and other partners and telling them, we are going to rebuild this canal, but we want you to build a value chain. And we shouldn't be stuck on the idea of taking credit for our work. It's about the international community working together to build resilience. So I would say uh, identify root causes in the country, and at the three stages, more in-depth design, more agile monitoring, and greater scaling up of results through partnerships. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased that towards the end you did add the word monitoring to ensure that we are on the right track and take the necessary steps to bring about the adjustments. And once we have data that confirms the results, we go about a scaling up agenda. But scaling up success stories, it has happened, and it's no secret, that sometimes there has been scaling up efforts of the wrong things. So of course, these go wrong eventually. So it is important to have the data, analysis, rigor, in ensuring that what we are going to scale up has been tried and tested, and as the lawyers would say, beyond reasonable doubt, so that we can scale up and have a pretty convincing case for results and impact at scale. But uh, Tarek, as a country program manager and, uh, and as a professional in agriculture and dryland agronomy and irrigation and livestock uh, movements in, in pastoralist environments, a lot of the questions and clarifications were around desertification, pastoralists and settle, settler communities and the fast-moving desertification. What's your take on, on handling and addressing these issues through the investments that we provide in these countries, in the Sahelian zone, for example, in the northern parts of Togo, as well as some of the arid and semi-arid lands that you are responsible for as a country manager? Thank you very much. This is um, really one of the parts that we should uh, focus and we should also exchange the, the, the lessons learned from uh, each other and from the different environment. Uh, the desertification actually is, is uh, one of uh, the consequences of the, let's say, the uh, climate change, but most importantly also by the bad use of the land and the resources we allocate and in, 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 in the different countries. So uh, it is quite important and very strategic to take this into consideration for our planning 
and to make sure that where are we going, th there should be resources to use, and there should be potential, and we should replicate and build on the success stories we have already built and have already gained, such as w water harvesting, such as a, uh, a increasing the uh, revenue from uh, agriculture, uh, such as uh, doing a uh, proper cropping pattern in the area, and uh, design a project actually which can be inclusive in including the whole community together, not only the uh, uh, targeting a particular uh, group of the society. So it's very important to be inclusive, very important to understand what is the causes for this desertification or for the lack of the resources, and how can we allocate the resources, the proper resources, to ensure that we have successful projects. And uh, along the line, as uh, everybody was really stressing, we should have a monitoring system that should address the impact of these projects at the different stages, not only to focus on a particular part, and when the project is ended, everybody forget about it and say that we, we had a project here, and you go there, and we, we see that there are some only ghosts in, in, in the place. No, we should monitor the project not only after graduation or after the project is concluded, but importantly, after a, uh, let's say, a couple of years to ensure that this project is still delivering. Thank you very much. I, I take it that uh, the investments also uh, provide the opportunity to introduce the appropriate technologies, uh, better seeds, better uh, cropping techniques, better harvesting of soil water, better storage, better distribution of water. All this in a very um, stable and technically sound uh, practice, uh, economically viable. Uh, so technology is also very important in addressing these, uh, these major issues and uh, we are all very proud that in IFAD we provide investments supported by a very strong technological base and this technology is provided or made available to us through the very, very strong collaborations that we have with centers of excellence, uh, be they the international uh, research institutions, FAO and other institutions that have this dedicated capacity to provide us with the right and appropriate technology in the right moment and facilitate the community capacity building to take on this technology in a, in a sustainable way. Madam, from Lebanon, uh, as we go forward and there are resources available, there is great interest at the political the leadership there is this ability to recognize what works better and what works less well. What, in your own mind, would be the most appropriate in the short term to invest in, in Lebanon, given all these situations that we have heard of uh, this afternoon? Some of the priority areas that would be of great interest to Lebanon. ضمن العمل في وزارة الزراعة قامت وزارة الزراعة ب. Well, thank you for that question. In the Ministry of Agriculture, we have adopted a strategic plan for the promotion of agriculture. The plan stretching from 2015 to 2019, and this plan takes into account the main focus areas of action and. Uh, First and foremost, promotion of uh, and conservation of natural resources. Conservation of natural resources is really key. And it has been important uh, to look very carefully at water resource management, which calls for a wise uh, utilization, rational utilization of water. And this is especially important in agriculture. The Ministry of Agriculture has a number of projects. I would say that the project that uh, aims at enhancing awareness of farmers, encouraging them to use green energy and to, and to use water wisely is the most important. We had a number of pilots which aimed at uh, providing training in the use of uh, green energy. And we also tried to 
help uh, farmers become more aware of uh, the use of wastewater, recycling uh, wastewater, to be able to reuse uh, this water in uh, uh, agriculture for irrigation. And so uh, there was this pilot, and it also um, helped to, to create awareness. There are other projects of the Ministry of Agriculture include planting 40 million trees to, to combat uh, uh, advancing desertification. as well as other projects in the uh, framework of the 2018 Paris Agreement that call for the um, contributions of countries to uh, the reduction of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, Lebanon is aiming at a 15% reduction by 2030. If we are to to um, receive uh, funding, uh, Lebanon could have the ambition of uh, reaching 30% reduction by 2030. So I'd say that these are some of the key elements for uh, natural resource uh, conservation. And this is part of the strategy of the Ministry of Agriculture. Other projects have um, aimed at supporting farmers through uh, projects aiming at uh, uh, livestock, in particular uh, forage production, other, um, other projects to assist uh, dairy farmers, small and, and larger scale. And uh, a financial package has been developed that aims at, at um, um, facilitating investment in areas uh, dedicated to dairy farming in the aim of bringing down production costs of dairy products so that other businesses, including um, dairy processing uh, businesses, can access the uh, raw material and produce at, at reasonable, affordable prices. There are other projects also in the poultry area and uh, assistance to uh, breeders to deal with uh, uh, avian uh, influenza or dealing with other diseases, um, in particular fruit fly disease. Some of these projects are supported by the government, uh, not only by the Ministry for Agriculture, but they receive broader support as well. Lebanon. Uh, of course, looks to uh, donor countries and international organizations, especially because of the, the inflow of refugees from Syria. The Ministry of Agriculture um, receives 0.4% of the budget. Therefore, the resources, uh, the budget for the Ministry of Agriculture have certainly uh, not sufficient, not enough to promote uh, the the agricultural sector. The government of Lebanon alone cannot cannot simply deal with the scope of the of the problem, and therefore we rely on assistance from donor countries, and on the projects uh, of uh, organisations and partner countries to be able to provide the necessary uh, assistance to the agricultural sector, and therefore FAO, IFAD, partner organizations are really important. There are three uh, projects that are currently being implemented together with IFAD at present. Uh, three different projects that uh, basically uh, together form one single project in combination. and. Um, this has been important, um, uh, assisting in the uh, settlement, trying to keep farmers in the rural area. Uh, Lebanon isn't only its cities, Lebanon is also its rural areas, its countryside. Um, the beauty and the importance of the country lies depends very much on, on protecting the rural environment. And if we were to lose that, we would lose uh, 
the model that has always been at the very basis of the social fabric of our country. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, panelists and governors and members, the president uh, of IFAD this morning confirmed and the governing council endorsed and approved that over the next three years, that is from 2019 to 2021, we will be uh, allocating about 25 to 30% of our program of loans and grants to support these very challenges that we've been talking about. So we are going to put our money, the money that you have provided to us, to address these causes. This brings it to about an envelope of about $1 billion in the next three years. What are the kinds of things you would like to see these investments support in the next three years as priority investments? I take away that you endorse that there is a need for some infrastructure. I take away that there is a need to really ensure that there is capacity building, that there is a need to support moving from emergency into investments that are going to give results and impact. But are there specifics that you'd really like us to work on as we roll out our plan and our strategic directions to ensure that IFAD is of great support to the membership, to your governments, to your communities, and get results and impact. Let's take some uh, questions and observations and feedback on that context. I see none. And I take it as a vote. No, I see one coming in a hurry. Uganda. That's a great one. So Uganda, you have the floor. Please help us. Uh, thank you very much, uh, moderator and the chair. Uh, one of the areas, my name is Vincent Sempija, Minister of Agriculture and Modest and Fisheries, Uganda. Uh, one of the areas is exactly as you have mentioned, the capacity building. But the only problem here is that when we talk about capacity building, we talk about building capacities of the technical, of the technical people. Talk about building capacity of the top leaders. But my own concern is that we must emphasize the people we are talking about, we, we want to, to help. These are the farmers, the rural people, the people themselves, the women, the youth. You cannot cause people to fight unless they themselves understand why they are fighting. The people want to change are uh, these vulnerable people on the ground. We need to make conscious programs to raise their understanding and therefore change their mindset. Because there is also a problem of mindset by the people we want to help. If they don't understand, why you are talking about fragility and what it means, if they don't understand why they are poor, if they don't understand why they should get out of the situation where they are, you may invest a lot of money, but it may not do much. So to me, I want to suggest that one of the areas that we need to emphasize is really the real contact we need to get our extension teams. We need to get those uh, country uh, offices to go to the, the real person on the ground. That's my suggestion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Very relevant and, and very uh, correct. In, uh, and I will not attempt to summarize, but I do have to say that you attach a lot of importance to being as close as possible 
to those that are most in need because they will benefit from this proximity in real time so that the transformation that needs to take place through building their capacity and better understanding of the challenges and issues will bear results. So we'll come back to that. Let us take uh, a few more points. We do have one at the back there. Vanuatu, please, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, moderator. Just on the, uh, the point raised by the noble minister of uh, Uganda, I think is a very important element. Um, why I just wanted to support his um, suggestions. The fact of the matter is that countries have people that are experts on these issues. And we should, as um, members of these organizations, use the local expertise and make sure that those people know exactly what um, the communities need because they work with them daily basis and they know the needs that are at stake, that they need our support. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very uh, important point. In fact, the delivery model of IFAD does emphasize that the proximity support is as much as possible, it's not always possible, but as much as possible, be based from the local community the local institutions that are closest to the community and those that are able, civil society, NGOs, and others, to be at close call to the needs of the uh, rural communities and smallholders and, and small farmers. So you are absolutely right. There are experts in these countries, in these environments, and we re re resonate with this very, very well. But what we often see and this is not a, something that we, uh, that we shy away from, is that often these experts need to have this ability to use their expertise in a very, very conducive environment. Sometimes, like we heard today, there were cases, and there are still cases of administrative rigor, which means you have to go through hundreds and hundreds of steps before you are actually able to bring about a few little um, you know, support uh, facilities to the communities. So the ability to also unleash the potential and the expertise that exists on ground is part of that political dialogue that was also mentioned here, and we are very sensitive to that also. Any other points from the, from the floor? Let's go back to the, to the panelists here and, yeah. Yes, let's go back to the panelists here and your takeaway from the feedback that you have had, the challenges that you have understood and relate to, some of the practical steps that are being sort of looked at in the bigger global sphere in terms of data and analytical work and rigor and policies and strategies to move forward. Let us hear from each one of you in about two minutes each on how to use this forum as a stepping stone to the next thing, make sure that the investments are well packaged, designed to give results and impact, not in 10 years or in 20 years time, but as soon as possible. Okay, I'll try my best. The point I'll take away from this interactive discussion is twofold. There are two faults. One is that we need to develop trust between developing partners and fragile states. Why I say trust is important? Because another acronym of the element of the New Deal is in itself by coincidence also trust. It means that the T stands for time, uh, um, uh, uh, timely and, uh, t timely and uh, deliver of aid. R means the risk, you know how to mitigate the risk. You means using country system, and etc. The point I want to make is this: that uh, according to my brother from Vanuatu and the others, you need to talk to the real people on the ground. People sometimes undermine that in fragile states because we are so fragile, so there are no experts, no people there. But remember, the mentality of the people in fragile states—they are so resilient. This is something that we need to 
belong to leverage first. Second point, there are success stories within the G7 plus countries that I want to share with you that I also, I also want you to take away with this. That we are the, in the bottom ladder of development. As you all know, in this whole world, you have developed country, you have upper and middle income country, you have low income country, and the bottom one is us, the fragile states. We are running the risk of not even achieving the MDG uh, 15 years ago, but now we're in the forefront to build or to advocate this uh, uh, goal number 16, which is building peace. But for us, the, the terminology is this, that there can be no peace without development. Or the other way, there can be no peace, no development without peace. But if you want to deliver the service to the people, we need to have a strong institution in order to be able to deliver uh, the service to the people. And that, again, you work with the government of the day, regardless whether the government is corrupt or the government is illegitimate, but they are the interlocutor of the particular government in fragile states. Because this is the fact. You can't penalize people in the government just because they are corrupt. They are human beings as well, like, like anybody else. Third point, the reason I mentioned success stories is this. I want to share with you, if, if, if there is any delegation from Central African Republic, I take my head out of you. Three years ago, when we went to Central African Republic in 2014 and 2015, there was a peak, you know, like a riot happening between two groups in that particular country. Peace was impossible to regain in that country. <coughs> But in our terminology, peace is possible. Why? Because you have a unique way of bringing people, the protagonists outside of the country, to have a closed door meeting so that they can talk to each other among themselves within about the challenge that they face in their own country. And suddenly, they requested our eminent person, who is the former president of Timor Leste and former prime minister of Timor Leste as well, he led a delegation to. Uh, Central African Republic, at the invitation of the government. He talked to the generals who fought each other. And he said this to them, gentlemen, can I talk to you like brothers? And these two generals look at each other, wondering why this guy coming from a small country in the Pacific to African country and talk to us like brothers? What vested interest does he have? And the Prime Minister asked, the former Prime Minister, who is a guerrilla fighter, by the way, he said this to them, do you know that the more you fight each other, the greater your natural resources being stolen by somebody else? And suddenly two generals said, oh, you're the one who started first. You are the one who started first. So the moral of the story is this, that stop your gun, Focus on your natural resource because you are rich in uranium, bauxite, mineral resources, and so on. Focus and develop your natural resources so that you can develop these and then service to the people and reduce your aid dependence. Unfortunately, Central African Republic is an orphan, an aid orphan. That's a fact. Pope went to, just one moment, Pope went to Central African Republic in 2015 in October. But beforehand, the G7 Plus led a mission which led to the Bangui Peace Forum in, in May 2014, a year before. And also at that time, 28,000 refugees were scattered around the airport of Bangui. Development partners, they all talk, 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 but the results, zero. The people remain in the airport. So the point I'm trying to say is this, that build the trust, talk to the people, use the country system, trust those government officials, because I know that uh, there are always a reservation from the international agents like IFAD or others to channel your resource to the country. But the point is this, there are some success stories, and Central African Republic is one of them. When the Pope went there, the government briefed them that peace is, peace is possible. And suddenly, the G7 Plus was asked to come and brief the Vatican. How did you do this so that peace was possible to, to come back to Central African Republic? Our simple answer was that, based simply on the principle of voluntarism, solidarity, and cooperation. With that note, I just want to say that, please, IFAD, officials, delegates, and governments, stay engaged with the people in fragile states, and when they succeed, the fragile states succeed, meaning that we are able 
to implement and to successfully claim our success in the agenda, implementation of the Agenda 2030. Thank you. Thank you very much, and much appreciated. These are very good points to take away. Minister Hussein, in one minute, what do you take away from this uh, session? May I, to move from fatality to resilience, it's only possible when the international partners decide to, em to empower the local mechanisms of the fragile states to cope with the shocks of fraud and disasters, and also to support the developmental projects, which are the which will eliminate the root causes of fragility, rather than doing cosmetic services to the symptoms of the root causes of the fragility. In Somalia, we are trying our best to co to, 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 to incapacity, to strengthen the local mechanisms of, 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 of facing the shocks of fraud. And we have a very good example. The last fraud which happened in 2016, there was local fundraising habits all over the country and also in the diaspora to support the victims of the drought where millions of dollars has been raised from school children to the corporate business people, everyone in his own capacity to contribute to the relief operation of that drought. So we need to, for our international partners, to strengthen the local mechanisms and also to look after the national developmental plans of the countries, fragile countries, and not to, not to impose agenda from outside. And also, and that's what IFAD is doing in our Ministry of Agriculture, where we have common priorities, and we hope the next year we will have a fruitful results from those projects. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Homegrown solutions are good solutions the way ahead. Madam Sheikh. Your one minute take. Uh, I would like to talk about Lebanon in particular. The Lebanese government revived the ECOSOC that was halted for 15 years. Uh, this council was founded in 1996. And two months ago, the government decided to reactivate the work in this council. The role of this council is to provide consultations and an advisory service to the government. It has many committees. A committee is dedicated to agriculture. And the council, along with the ministry, will develop an agricultural policy and a development plan of action for each governorate in Lebanon. The objective is to work according to this fashion in order to advance economy and agriculture so that we can support local communities across each governorate so that they can participate and they can take part in the decision-making process when it comes to the development work. I would like to confirm that this council, along with the Ministry of Agriculture and the relevant committees, would take into account the role of women that represent half of the Lebanese society with a focus on the youth role. The elite among youth are the only segment capable of accommodating the challenges in Lebanon. We all know that Lebanon has specific burdens, but some burdens can be translated into opportunities. For example, the multi-ethnic and confessional nature of Lebanon, along as the multi-partisan face of Lebanon can be an opportunity. The work will be conducted in each governorate. We would like to take into account the collaboration with the international organization, 
candidly, we would like to confirm that we do rely on these organizations when it comes to mega projects. I would like to ask IFAD to understand uh, the uh, crisis in Lebanon or the crisis that affect Lebanon and that uh, delay some projects in our country. This is uh, beyond our control, unfortunately, and this is not something we want. We need these projects. We need to uh, expedite the work pace in order to implement all activities. However, unfortunately, during two specific circumstances and some challenges, the work is delayed. I hope you can take this into consideration and I would like to thank all participants and everyone attending this session. Thank you very much. Uh, Tarek, uh, you are the country program manager and all that has been said is now in your hands. And I take that investments have to be inclusive. We have to expedite. We have to get results. We have to allocate the resources to the situations that need these resources, your take in one minute. In a nutshell, really, we have done a, uh, a lot of procedures to, to overcome the fragility of the country, like having partnership with our sister organizations of the UN and the FAO under the RBA agreements. We increased, and thanks to the BDM, the uh, uh, budget for the supervision and for our presence in the country and our support and we brought uh, the best expertise to solve very critical and uh, implementation problems. Uh, we changed the approach, we've been very flexible of implementing a project and we involved with the private sector instead of a, the lack of capacity in, in the governmental institutions or the uh, NGOs and we uh, conducted high level meetings with ministers to terminate obstructing decrease and uh, exempt EFAT projects from some blocking procedures from, from spending. And we've taken uh, the lead to design a project uh, which has been approved by September board in 2017 uh, using the PIPAS allocation for Lebanon and uh, also with the, using the farms uh, contribution, which was also very huge compared to the total budget of the project. And we have been attracting a lot of uh, development partners to, to play a very effective role in our design. We're getting security clearance. We've been to every part in the country and every spot and every site. In a nutshell, let me, let me say that our message for today, in a very brief way, that IFAD really has demonstrated strong commitment to the rural communities in Lebanon, and we can do still more according to the, uh, the, the request from the governor, but that typical solutions do not normally work in the situations of fragility. Let's agree on that. And rural people know a lot about effective solutions. They know better. They only know how to mobilize them and how to get the ideas out of their hands and out of their minds. And community-based solutions usually emerge from the people uh, with proven track record, and uh, development partners must never surrender to fragility and fragile situation. They should continue to try and focus on non-traditional solutions. In doing so, all development partners can draw the nation's attention, including the government and the beneficiaries, and cooperate fully to save some communities, even if their monetary contribution does not seem huge. Thank you very much. We are down to our last couple of seconds. So you have the last few seconds. Thank you. Uh, in wrapping up, I would say that with Somalia and with our other partners in fragile situations, we, I'll, I'll take less than a minute. We bring more funds, we bring more knowledge, we build partnerships, and we build a bridge. Let me just elaborate. We, build, we bring more money either uh, through the IFAD Vulnerability Index in the PBAS or through non-PBAS sources such as farms, which really helps us address specific crises. We bring more knowledge by uh, doing more in-depth analysis of root causes, or we bring more knowledge through South-South and Triangular Cooperation. We invest more in partnerships, both with, our donor, uh, with the donor community to enhance aid effectiveness and with national institutions to enhance capacity. And we use all of these to make sure that IFAD is a bridge 
between humanitarian and development financing, and IFAD should be the key institution between relief and resilience. And we help our communities move from relief to resilience. Thank you very much. This is Thank highly you. appreciated. Dear governors, members, the panelists, it has been a very big pleasure for me to moderate this session, and I do thank the panelists for their participation, and to you, distinguished guests, for the lively discussions. Your contributions have been appreciated, and we have taken note, and we will be rolling it out as committed by our staff, but also as the uh, implementing agencies in countries like Somalia and Lebanon. You all deserve a resounding round of applause. Can I get that? <laughs> Thank you very much. Much appreciated. Yes.